it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Man in Black by Taxi Dancer Part 1 The Contract They look just like us. They walk among us unnoticed, blending in so perfectly that no one will recognize them for who and what they actually are. But at night, when the sun goes down and the dark shadows hide every corner of the city, they reveal their true forms as they emerge into the black of night out of their secret lairs and bat-infested caves to hunt people like me. With claw or with wing, with cunning or with heightened senses, with mystical powers or with simple brute strength, they hunt us down when the night of the sun fades behind the horizon, as if we were animals. And almost every week, we wake in the morning to see the horrific news that they got one of the best of us. Our numbers grow thin, while they grow stronger in secret. Indeed, it was relatively safe to go out during the day. It was extremely risky to be out on the streets at night, for in the darkest corners of the city, that's where they found us and took us. We didn't know where they came from or how many of them there were, but we did know that where we were once at home in the night, we now had to hide from the dark. Somehow the law firm of J. White and Fisk managed to find me and sent me one of their firm's new interns to meet and discuss a somewhat risky proposal. I had briefly worked for the firm over a year prior when they hired me to deal with a problematic aquatic entity that was causing disruptions for the firm at the port transit terminal. The aftermath of that encounter caused quite a bit of consternation among the public and law enforcement, and I was consequently forced to leave the country and lay low for a few months living quite comfortably in a secluded chalet in Sicily, overlooking the Mediterranean. However, I had recently felt that it was safe for me to return to New York, where I lived a rather reclusive lifestyle for the past year. The intern introduced herself to me simply as Petrova, and granted, while her stunning beauty did gain her access into my penthouse, her proposal left me with some very deep reservations. Something lurks the city streets at night, she began. Something that snatches up victims in the darkness and leaves them hanging on streetlights for the police to find in the morning. She made herself comfortable on one of my couches as I passed her a cup of Earl Grey tea and poured one for myself. Thanking me, she pulled out a small tablet and leaned over to show me the screen. We captured this on CCTV the other night just outside of a warehouse complex owned by the firm. I tried to focus on the video she was showing me, but her voice was so seductive and her white blouse was unbuttoned so low that I admit that I was somewhat distracted. Still, I remained expressionless as I watched a grainy video of four men in a darkened parking lot near the docksides, the only illumination seeming to come from two streetlights and the lights from the warehouses. All of a sudden, something inhumanly quick and humanoid-shaped emerged from the shadows and snatched up one of the men, carrying him out of frame. The other three startled men, which I now noticed were wearing black tactical fatigues, pulled out small automatic handguns and frantically began shooting at something just off frame of the cameras. Apparently missing their target, the thing then leapt in and out of the picture like a praying mantis seizing a fly, each time snatching up and taking away one of the men, until they were nowhere to be seen. The entire event took place in less than twenty seconds, and as the CCTV camera panned around the lot... There was nothing left to be seen save the empty parking lot, the warehouses, and the empty bank truck which the men had been driving. The video ended, and I leaned back, perplexed. So, uh, do you know what that thing is? No, Petrova admitted. But the thing has been disrupting operations for a year, and the firm would like it taken care of, if possible. Hmm, I see. A year? Did the firm try any means of dealing with the thing during that time? I mean, do you have any other intel on that creature? Well, Petrova said reluctantly, we did send three separate operatives to take care of it before we contacted you, but unfortunately all three have disappeared, presumably taken by that thing. Petrova then presented a black leather pouch and passed it across my coffee table. You were the firm's first choice to send on this mission, seeing as you've had some experience in dealing with these creatures. 
but you've been very difficult to find after your last mission against that aquatic entity. I sipped a bit of my tea and replied, Yes, well, after that affair, I thought it wise to lay low for a while. In fact, I'm not sure if it's safe yet to take on another mission. Petrova sipped her tea and nodded. That was a wise decision. Similar creatures of its ilk would surely have come hunting for you. The young woman leaned her head forwards, gesturing towards the pouch, a lock of her wavy strawberry blonde hair falling lazily in front of her face. However, the firm was hoping that this might persuade you to come out of hiding for one more assignment. I unzipped the pouch to find a keycard and a half million in cash. The keycard is to a safe deposit box with an additional two million in cash. Petrova smiled, finishing her tea. With the completion of your assignment, I'll deliver to you another keycard to a safe deposit box containing an additional two and a half million. I stared at her for a second. Petrova looking at me with an alluring expression as if daring me to say no to her. Five million. That's over twice the amount they paid me for the last assignment, I said. This creature seems to be a lot cleverer than the one you last encountered, though perhaps not quite as strong, answered Petrova. We just don't know yet. Anyway, would you be interested in taking the contract? I'll need as much data as you can give me, I replied, deciding that I'd take the assignment, though I wasn't quite sure if it was because of the money or because of her seductively innocent green eyes. Intel, videos, witness statements, everything that can help me track down this creature. New York is a huge city. Tracking down something like this is going to be difficult. Petrova smiled, as if knowing that I wouldn't be able to turn her down. Most of its attacks have been in low-rent, high-crime districts. You may want to start your investigation around Hell's Kitchen, where its last two attacks took place. And the rest of the data. Petrova pulled out a silver thumb drive from her pocket. Everything that we have on the creature is on this. Pictures, videos. It's all right here. As I took it from her, Petrova added, Also, you might want to peruse the local paper. The newspaper editor also seems to have it out for that thing. After Petrova left, I spent over a week studying everything that I could on the creature. There wasn't much on the thumb drive to go on which could help me in my search. Frustratingly, all of the pictures and video images were grainy, the video which Petrova showed me being the best images of the creature I could find. The problem was that all of the images of it were captured at night or in very low light. Still, the thing did look humanoid in shape, though somewhat short and slender. Like others of its kind, it probably walked around the population during the day, but at night, and in its true form, it slinked around in the dark spaces of the crime-ridden parts of New York City, stalking its unsuspecting prey before jumping down upon them and dragging them into the night. Well, the thing was inhumanly fast, and by my estimation, based on the few video captures of the entity, could jump to a height and length of between 20 to 25 meters. In addition, according to the witness statements of the very few victims that managed to escape from it, the creature had an unusual ability to generate some type of substance with which to entrap its prey. In the week that I was researching the creature, a newspaper article appeared which showed the police recovering the four men that were in the video that Petrova showed me. After another week of studying the creature's habits, it was time for me to begin the actual stalk. It was undoubtedly intelligent, having been able to elude the police and actually defeating the three operatives which were sent before me to bring it down. During the day, I set up small spy cameras on buildings and structures in areas of the city where the creature supposedly stalked at night. Using city maintenance and construction uniforms, I was able to set up cameras on the tops of streetlights and stoplights of busy traffic intersections. It's amazing the things someone wearing a service uniform and confidently behaving as if they know what they're doing could get away with. As such, in a crowded city well used to constant construction and maintenance, I was able to cover nearly a six-block area of the city with spy cameras in full view of thousands of people who never saw me. At the same time, I was choosing my equipment for the eventual time that I would complete the stalk and initiate the hunt. For the hunt, I decided that automatic weapons would not be the best tool to complete the job, 
not in the middle of the city, and not after I'd seen footage of the creature avoiding being hit by operatives armed with pistol-caliber automatic weapons. Uh, I'd need a more precise weapon, so I chose the compact M4A6 sniper rifle, the same type that I used as a PMC sniper in Iraq. This wouldn't be the weapon which I expected to use to kill the creature, as I doubted that I'd be able to hit it. I noticed that the creature used hit-and-run tactics against operators armed with guns, either biding its time to swiftly come in close to strike, or disengaging when it failed to close the distance. To defeat this thing, I had to bring it in close to me. To complete my loadout, I'd carry a pair of Heckler and Cork HK-45 pistols and my trusty bayonet. For three nights, I remotely viewed the video feed from the twelve small CCTV cameras which I'd previously set up. Six cameras were located atop streetlights and stop signals inside Hell's Kitchen, while the remaining six were emplaced on buildings and rooftops surrounding the area. It was three nights of wasted effort, as my cameras caught nothing of interest, and the news was devoid of stories about victims of the creature being discovered. However, on the fourth night, near the docks on 12th Avenue, one of my cameras mounted near one of the firm's warehouses captured the fleeting image of a ghostly image flying past and going in a southerly direction. The next morning, Petrova called me, stating that one of the firm's deliveries had been intercepted and two more employees had been taken. Then, on the seventh night, shortly before midnight, the camera that I'd placed on top of a streetlight on the corner of West 47th Street and 10th Avenue in the heart of Hell's Kitchen started picking up something. Or rather, something picked it up. A small spy camera was suddenly lifted off of its mounting and a humanoid head bereft of any facial features save for two giant white eyes stared down into the camera. Then the feed abruptly turned to static as if the camera had been crushed. I had another camera mounted atop the 42nd Street Port Authority bus terminal which I quickly switched to and was able to get a good look at the slender creature perched precariously atop the streetlight, seemingly looking around for other cameras before swiftly jumping away and disappearing into the night. Again, its speed was incredible, and my camera only detected a blurry image disappearing into the sky towards the southwest. I was perplexed. Could this creature fly? Was this the legendary Mothman? I didn't see any external wings. Perhaps this was the so-called rake, or what people described as the Slender Man. If so, why is it stalking around Hell's Kitchen? Why would it have such an interest in the business dealings of the law firm of J. Wyden Fisk? The next day, I discovered that six of my spy cameras had been disabled, including the one atop the 42nd Street bus terminal, but that the remaining ones which bordered Hell's Kitchen still remained active. That evening, three more of my cameras went offline, one at 21.50 hours, the next one at 22.05 hours, and the last one at 22.17 hours. This left me deeply perplexed. The distance between all three cameras was about two and a half miles, and they were all mounted and hidden in elevated spots. That meant that in a little over 30 minutes, the thing was able to track down and destroy all three of those cameras. How? Did it see me emplacing them during the day? Did it have some type of natural jamming method? There were literally millions of CCTV cameras in the city. How did it know to locate only the ones I in place? Perhaps it had some kind of heightened sensory powers, such as ESP. None of my other remaining working cameras, which were located a mile north of the ones which had been recently destroyed, picked up anything. But I did notice that the three cameras which went offline were in line which pointed south. Two things became obvious to me. One, the thing now knew that it was being hunted and would doubtless be more cautious. And two, the thing's lair was somewhere south of Hell's Kitchen, perhaps even south of the city proper. In any event, it was time for me to initiate the stalk, as I didn't want the thing to go into hiding. It had demonstrated much more intelligence and intuition than I'd expected, but that was to be expected from these kind of cryptids. But where to look? South of Hell's Kitchen narrowed my search parameters, but that was still a gigantic search parameter. I contacted Petrova once again, this time asking her when and where the creature first came onto the firm's radar. 
She put me on hold for a few minutes before coming back and saying that the suspected creature was also active around the Staten Island area, about 20 miles south of Hell's Kitchen. In fact, she added, one of the creature's first sightings occurred a few miles from the campus of Empire State University. The lawyers J. White and Fisk, along with several of their associates, were meeting at a restaurant near the college to discuss combining their firms into one law firm. Apparently that's when the creature first struck. Hmm, I see. And what happened during the attack? I'm not sure, answered Petrova. That's a closely guarded secret of the firm. But I would assume that event was the underlying reason why J. White and Fisk decided to form one company. Why they're so adamant to stop these creatures. When did that first attack occur? I asked. Uh, hang on a second, said Petrova. I could hear her typing something on a keypad. Here it is. Yes, our office records show that the first appearance of the creature occurred a little over a year and a half ago. In fact, it first appeared a month before you took care of the water entity that was disrupting the firm's operations at the port. Now, perhaps, I should have asked why the activities of a distinguished law firm would be targeted by such creatures, but I really wasn't concerned about it. My job was to hunt the entities down and collect a paycheck. As is not a reason why and all that shit. Okay, thanks, I said. I'm going to begin the stalk down in Staten Island tonight. Can you reserve me a room near the university? A cheap one, nondescript. Sure, I'll text you the address in a few minutes. Then Petrova added, How long do you think it will take? Uh, depends. I answered. Don't think I'll need any special weapons to take this creature down, but I have a nagging feeling in the back of my mind that I'm missing something. Really? Like what? I don't know. Almost as soon as I took care of the water entity, another creature appeared to attack the firm's assets. Do you suppose that the two creatures were working together? Petrova chuckled slightly. I very seriously doubt that. These two entities, or creatures, or whatever you want to call them, are completely different and worlds apart. Maybe even universes apart. Yeah, I conceded. You're right. I may be just overthinking things. I'll call you as soon as I get some results. Okay, said Petrova. Be safe out there. I hung up the phone and began preparation for the night's stalk. It was a few hours before sunset and I needed to get down to Staten Island and the recon area. Part 2. The Stork A hungry bear will usually conduct its initial hunt relatively close to the location of where it first awakens from hibernation. Since the creature's first recorded sighting was a few miles from Empire State University and was an attack against the founders of the law firm, I figured that would be the best place to start. My gut feelings told me that the creature's lair was somewhere near the university. Petrova had reserved a corner room for me on the top floor of the Courtyard Hotel, about a mile from the college. To be safe, Petrova also reserved the two rooms next to mine to ensure my privacy. Initially, I drove down in a rented, nondescript minivan where I brought the things that I needed to begin the stalk up to my room. Just after sunset, I returned to my residence and retrieved my motorcycle, a jet black Indian Challenger Elite. I didn't intend to set up any more cameras in the area, as the creature could somehow sense that they were a threat, and I didn't want to tip it off that I was here. By now, it was well after nightfall, and time to begin the storm. I'd earlier removed the bulbs from the outside lights in front of the three rooms which Petrova had reserved for me, leaving a near black corner of the top floor. Additionally, right before sunset, I'd found a way to the rooftop where I'd hidden a duffel bag in a black, hard plastic case. Under cover of the dark corner of the building, I made my way to the roof of the hotel unnoticed by anybody. Once on the rooftop, I recovered my duffel bag, pulling out a set of black uniform fatigues, black climbing boots, a black modular tactical vest, and a black face mask. I rested a set of AGM NVG 40 night vision goggles on my forehead and pulled out an additional set of thermal binoculars. From the case... I assembled my M40A6 sniper rifle. In a holster on my left hip, 
I had one of the HK-45 pistols, or the second pistol I placed in a holster connected across my modular vest. In pouches attached to my vest, I also had two additional magazines for each of the pistols and four additional magazines for my sniper rifle. Finally, I slid my bayonet into the sheath on my right hip. This courtyard hotel was six stories tall and built atop a small hill just outside of an upper middle class suburb and provided a reasonably good view of the surrounding area. It was a slightly overcast night, with the moon drifting in and out behind the black rolling clouds. I didn't expect to spot the creature tonight, so I was going to use this time to scan my surroundings, plot locations of possible future observation points, as well as scout probable routes that the creature might take to move unobserved from here north to its hunting grounds in Hell's Kitchen. I also had an area map that I took from the front desk, which I used to calculate firing ranges and engagement angles for my rifle from this vantage point. I was able to conclude that there were locations within a mile radius of the hotel which offered better observation points to track the creature if, indeed, the creature's hiding place was near the college. It was after midnight... I was marking off alternate observation points which I could investigate in the morning when the door to the roof opened. I slowly ducked down behind an air conditioning element and silently peered around the corner to see two hotel employees standing in the dim light cast by the stairwell leading to the roof. It was a young black man and a young Latino woman wearing the hotel's custodian uniform. They were apparently taking a smoke break, and soon the heavy scent of marijuana and conspiratorial laughter drifted towards me. It was then, out of a corner of my eye, I perceived a faint shadow flickering from the building across the parking lot. The parking lot was fairly well lit, from a good number of streetlights, and the reflection cast upon the surrounding buildings made any sort of movement, however slight, noticeable to anyone who was actively observing for something unusual. Without moving, I shifted my gaze to my right, to the next building about a hundred meters away. It was a bank building five stories high, and I was able to look down on it from my vantage point. There was something crouching on the corner of the rooftop, like a gargoyle, facing away from me and towards the college. It was skinny, with absolutely no facial features, except for two large, bulbous white eyes. Slowly and silently, I shrank back into the shadows made my way the few feet back to my rifle. I stealthily lifted the butt of the rifle to my shoulder and centered the IR sight on the creature. It was an eerie-looking thing, human in shape but extremely exaggerated in its crouching pose, as if its joints were inhumanly flexible. It did look like what some described as a rake, or even the Slender Man. I centered the sight on the creature's head, silently flipped the selector switch on my rifle to fire when, all of a sudden, it hopped around and faced my building, its bulging white eyes directed up at me. From behind me gave a muffled squeal. Silently turning my head, I could see from the corner of my eyes the young female hotel worker pulling down her pants and bending over against the wall, smiling in anticipation while her male companion unzipped his pants. Cursing to myself, I quickly turned my head to reacquire the target, only to see it jump off the building and into the darkness, disappearing in the direction of the college. Oh, fuck, I thought. Minutes later, I was back in my hotel room, on the phone to Petrova. To my surprise, the phone rang only once before she picked up, Petrova sounding as if she'd expected my call. What's the situation? Were you able to engage the target? Um, no, I answered, somewhat caught off guard. But I got a good look at it, and I'm sure that its lair isn't near the college, but somehow in the college. Really, she answered. Once again, I could hear frantic typing into a keyboard in the background. That's odd. Our records don't indicate any attacks or disappearances at the college relating to the creature. Are you sure that's where it lives? No. I admitted, but I intend to check the place out. Does the college have any internal security force? Uh, hang on a second, Petrova replied, her typing on the keyboard quickening. No, the school contracts out its security to a private company, Pietmont Security Services. Can you get me one of their uniforms? 
There was a brief pause as I heard Petrova tapping away on her computer. Yeah, I'll have a set delivered to the front desk for you in the morning. For a second, I wanted to ask her how much influence the law firm had that they could have a security uniform for a prestigious New York college delivered to me within the span of a few hours, but I decided against it. I remembered a time about ten years ago when, during the height of the battle for the city of Fallujah, my PMC organization was able to deliver New York-style pizzas with extra trees and pepperoni and ice-cold Cokes from U.S. Army CH-47 Chinook helicopters to the front lines of the battlefield. If you had the money and the influence, there wasn't much that you couldn't accomplish. My stroll around the campus of Empire State University revealed that the security on site was adequate at best. The Piedmont security staff was impressively large, but also so impersonal that none of them even thought to ask me who I was, not even the old sleepy-eyed shift leader whom they called Bloody Ned. I was just a nameless faceless, person in a security uniform and badge, tasked with walking around the campus, checking doors and windows, and accompanying students to and from classes. As long as I confidently and professionally displayed that I belonged there doing security stuff, no one, including old bloody Ned, cared who I was. I spent the next couple of days doing reconnaissance around the sprawling campus grounds, taking mental notes and calculating where the best places would be to set up observation points. In the crowded campus hallways, I remained mostly unnoticed by the students and staff, except for a very brief moment on the second day when some nerdy kid with short wavy brown hair stopped to stare at me for a second in the hallway, leading to the science labs. By the end of the third day, I decided that my next observation stand would be atop one of the central dormitory buildings, as they were the tallest buildings on site, which offered the best view of the campus. There were no sightings of the creature, and Petrova confirmed that it hadn't been spotted up in Hell's Kitchen either, but I felt certain that it was around here somewhere. And it was here. I could somehow feel that it was here. Over the course of the next few days, I had acquired the keys to the door which accessed the roof of one of the central dormitories, and I was able to sash away my equipment and weapons on that rooftop. Each dormitory on campus was four stories tall and the one which I'd chosen gave me an almost limitless vantage point over the entire campus. From here I should have been able to observe the creature's movements. In the ensuing two days, I worked as a security guard until the sunset, at which time I pretended to do a security patrol to the dormitory where my gear was located on the roof. I was seen by many, but remembered by none. This time, there was little activity on the campus, as it was the beginning of spring break. Many of the students and staff were busy preparing to leave for a week. Those few students who remained on campus continued living their lives, blissfully unaware of the horrendous monster that lurked in their midst. Well, the first night on the roof was completely uneventful. The students came and went, cars came in and out, but absolutely nothing else of significance happened. On the second night, however, Petrova called me on my cell phone, saying that the creature had just appeared at around 2300 hours at the 12th Street docks of Hell's Kitchen and had just attacked a group of associates working for the firm who were unloading goods from a small merchant vessel. I was again perched on my hidden observation site atop the dormitory at the college, and I responded by saying that if the creature was returned to this location, judging by the speed and distance the creature could travel, it would make the journey from Hell's Kitchen to the college in roughly one hour. Petrova again cautioned me to be careful, as the rake, or the Slenderman, or whatever this creature was, had proven to be just as physically powerful as the aquatic entity that I'd defeated over a year ago. Ending the call, I hunkered down and waited for it to return, all the while wondering how I'd missed it. If the creature emerged from its lair somewhere here in the campus, I should have spotted it. There were tunnels and passageways which crisscrossed under the campus, and I explored them all. All of them led to known entrances and exits. There were no secret passageways which led out of the campus grounds. So, how did I miss it? Unless the entity could appear human and simply travel directly to the place that it intended to attack before transforming into its true form. Was this some sort of shapeshifter? A teleporter? Maybe my target wasn't the rake or the slender man. Maybe some sort of skinwalker. Or maybe they were all one in the same. 
Still, those entities were assumed to be reclusive creatures. Why would it have a lair right in the middle of a college campus? Perhaps this thing was a vampire. Maybe. I mean, the creature's method of attack was similar to vampires, but also vastly different. It didn't make sense. I settled down deeper into the shadows, senses alert and eye resting on the scope of my rifle. And I waited. At around 0300 hours, I was suffering eye strain from hours of looking through my night vision devices, and it was giving me a headache. The creature was late, or perhaps I'd missed seeing it. There was absolutely nothing happening, and I began to doubt if my gut feelings were right. My instincts aren't often wrong. But sometimes... There. 350 meters to my left front, a slender entity suddenly appeared atop the science and astronomy building. I'm not sure if it flew down and landed or simply appeared out of thin air, but the thing was suddenly there, illuminated in the moonlight. I put down my thermal binoculars and took up my sniper rifle, tracking the thing with my IR scope. The creature crouched down low, turning its head this way and that as if sniffing the air for prey. Magnified in my night vision scope, the creature appeared as a bright yellow-green figure illuminated in fine detail, silhouetted against the moon. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I could get this thing with my sniper rifle. At this moment, nothing existed out of what was at the end of my rifle scope. I centered its head in my sight reticle, slowly increased the pressure on the trigger. All of a sudden, the creature jumped and hopped around in a half circle until it was facing me. I took the shot, and a muffled boom <clears throat> echoed across the campus. Impossibly, the thing jumped aside and either leapt or fell off the edge of the three-story building it had been crouching on. Did I get it? Did it dodge the shot? How did it know I was here? If I did kill it, I'd find out about it in the morning. But if it survived then... Shit. If it survived and it knew where I was, then it'd be trying to flank me. I slung my weapon around my back and turned, running across the dark rooftop to the repelling line that I'd placed on the opposite side of the building, grateful that the moon's illumination was hidden behind the clouds. I took a half second to peer over the side to ensure that the coast was clear before grabbing up the line, stepping over the edge of the roof and fast roping down the side of the building. As I hit the ground, I heard a faint thump coming from above me, alerting me that the creature was on the roof of the building I'd just been on. Instinctively, I somersaulted into the shadows provided by a line of decorative shrubbery lining the sidewalk. Snatching my two pistols from their holsters, I spun around, still in the kneeling position, and looked up from the dubious cover of the bushes. A second later, the thing's head peered over the ledge of the roof, bulging white eyes frantically scanning the grounds. The repelling line that I'd just used was tied off, just a few feet to its left. The rooftop wasn't illuminated, and apparently the creature didn't see the rope, and, more importantly, didn't see me. Perhaps realizing that it was making itself a target, the creature slowly ducked its head under the ledge, and a second later, I saw its ghostly form leap into the night, disappearing behind yet another building and campus. Hmm. Interesting. Despite having such huge eyes, the thing apparently couldn't see in the dark. That bit of knowledge was a tool that I'd keep in my toolbox to use later. Staying in the shadows, I crept into one of the nearby maintenance buildings that had a passage which led into the labyrinth of tunnels underneath the campus. I slumped down on a broken office chair in the pitch-black darkness of an access tunnel, my mind frantically going over everything that I'd learned about the creature. I hadn't had a wink of sleep in the last two days, but even without the cocaine, I was still way too wired up to even consider resting. There were three things which I had to consider before I could engage with this creature again. First, the thing could apparently sense when it had been spotted, or perhaps it could sense when it was in danger. That's why neither I nor any of the other operatives could hit it. A shot fired at a range of 350 meters was plenty of time and distance for the creature to avoid the bullet. 
In fact, I'd say that at ranges of at least 50 meters, the thing had proven to have the ability to avoid being shot. If I was to have any chance of hitting it, I'd have to bring it to near point-blank range. Second, I had to get it at least 50 meters away from any buildings or structures. I needed to get it far from streetlights, trees, poles, anything which gave it elevation or cover to hide behind. That's how it was able to just swoop in and snatch up its victims. My estimation of how high and how far the thing could leap was fairly accurate. I'd have to lure it into a fairly flat and wide open area. And third, the thing couldn't see in the dark. I could use that to my advantage somehow. One thing was for certain. My trying to go after it hadn't been successful, especially now that it knew I was stalking it. I had to turn the tables on the thing. I had to make it come after me. Part 3. The Hunt Okay, Petrova, level with me. What does the creature have on the lore firm? I mean, what kind of people do your bosses represent? Has the creature ever gone after any of the law firm's clients? I stuck around in the catacombs under the college for about an hour before leaving the campus just prior to sunup, and as soon as I got back to the hotel, I had Petrova on the line. Once again, even though it was barely past 0500 in the morning, Petrova had picked up the phone after the first ring, as if she'd been waiting for my call. No, she answered. There are absolutely no instances of the creature going after any of the firm's clients. The thing only attacks the firm's associates. Petrova, I said, probably sounding exhausted and punch drunk. What exactly are your bosses into? I mean... Why does the law firm of J. Wyden Fisk need to hire an army of tactical security? Why were those men attacked on the docks? I really don't know, Petrova admitted. The firm didn't need to hire protection until they started being attacked by those monsters or cryptids. And to be honest, if I did know, I probably couldn't tell you. I do know that the firm is into a lot of things, a lot of philanthropic activities. Investments in foreign markets to aid third world economies. Cancer research for children. Well, that sort of thing. But, like the Hunter Biden laptop and how the Clintons managed to off Jeffrey Epstein, we aren't allowed to talk about it. Uh, I know a front when I see one. Like Operation Fast and Furious, when Mexican drug cartels used the 50 cal machine guns that Obama sent them against our DEA, Border Patrol, and Army National Guard. Uh, but that's echelons above my pay grade. Uh, the thing that I'm hunting is frighteningly intelligent. I'm just looking for a motivation for its actions. I yawned as the first rays of the sun peeked through my curtains. By the way, do you know if your bosses have any other philanthropic activities scheduled soon? No, she answered. The firm curtailed all of its extracurricular activities pending the outcome of your current mission. Why do you ask? Because I'm developing the next battlefield. Can you leak the word out on the street that the firm is planning the same type of activity that usually attracts the creature to attack? Whatever it is that your bosses are doing that seems to be pissing off Slenderman, can you start a rumor that it's going down soon? Well, I'll have to run it through Mr. White and Mr. Fisk, but I'm sure they'll give me the go-ahead if that means safeguarding their associates. Where do you want this event to occur? 12th Street Docks? No, I answered. When I told Protova where I wanted the location of the next engagement to take place, she chuckled unbelievingly. Really? said Petrova in a tone that said she thought I was pulling her leg. You want me to get you that? You want to select seats or maybe an entire section? I want the whole thing, Petrova, all of it. And I want it for an entire night. Are you kidding me? Petrova was beside herself. Do you know how much that'll cost the firm? I mean, the scheduling, the logistics. Not to mention that you'll severely piss off every hardcore Yankees fan in the universe. I mean, they're in the World Series. I was never much into baseball, much less a Yankees fan. In fact, during my self-imposed exile in Europe, I'd become somewhat of a soccer fanatic. So, 
Can Widen Fist do it or not? I said. They called me crazy, but you know what? You're crazy. I couldn't tell if Petrova was annoyed at me or excited at the audacity of my plan. Yes, we can get it for you. But it will take time, not to mention that we have to get that rumor out on the streets. Good, I replied. Why are you doing that? I'm going to take a nap. Oh, and one more thing, I said as an afterthought. You're pushing it, said Petrova. I need to be able to control the lights remotely. I continued, pretending that I didn't hear her last comment. Yeah, I figured you'd ask for that, she said. In the background, I could hear her literally banging on her keyboard. You'd better be worth all this. I'm putting my ass on the line recommending that this be approved. I wouldn't even dream of doing this for any of the other operatives. I love you too, I said. The words completely left my mouth before my sleep-deprived brain could stop me, and I instantly regretted it. Well, yeah, prove it. Get that creature, Petrova said without hesitation and without missing a beat. The last clown that I dated was all promises and no delivery. I hate clowns, even one that I work for. She suddenly hung up, abruptly leaving me too confounded to be sleepy anymore. What did she mean by that? Was she leaving the door open for me? Did she just say she'd date me if I took care of that creature? I chastised myself for allowing such thoughts to enter my mind, just as in combat in Iraq, when dealing with the supernatural creatures that I've been contracted to hunt, distractions like that is what got you killed. (sighs) What are you things? Where did you come from? Are you cryptids? Ancient legends? Elder gods? Lying in my bed, my mind swam with these questions and hundreds more. If you are gods, why do you die? Images flashed in my head from over a year ago. The aquatic beast had risen from the polluted waters of the Hudson River near the docks. Nothing that I did could stop it as the monster proved to be fast, powerful, and near bulletproof. It couldn't fly, but the thing could jump a great distance, and as the monster stalked after me, I turned and ran from it. I had an M4 carbine with an M203 grenade launcher mounted under the barrel. I was out of rifle ammunition, but I still had two grenades left, one 40mm high explosive grenade loaded in the launcher. My lungs were bursting for air as I ran past the three-story cylindrical oil storage tanks. The thing had chased me for nearly a mile across the piers. Docked at the pier next to me, the tanker ship was pumping crude oil into the storage tanks as terrified dock workers were scrambling to get out of the way of the waterborne nightmare. Unfortunately, the creature ignored the fleeing workers and focused its attention on me. It seemed to laugh arrogantly as it closed the distance, and with good reason. It knew it had me. I twisted suddenly as I ran and fired my last high-explosive grenade into the pipe pumping oil from the tanker ship to the oil storage unit. The blast ripped the pipe in half, the pressure of the pumps violently drowning the aquatic abomination with black crude oil. It slipped and fell on the docks as I continued running, trying to put as much distance between me and the humanoid fiend as possible. I pulled the last grenade from my pouch, a 40mm incendiary round, at a distance of less than 50 meters, fired it directly at the humanoid creature. It held out its arms, eyes which once regarded me with contempt, now wide with terror. I dove into the water as the docks erupted in a fireball of destruction, the agonized screams of the aquatic entity echoing in my ears. Dolphins surrounded me as I swam deeper into the murky gray waters, my arms and legs pumping as I tried to escape the blazing inferno which was now engulfing the entire pier behind me. The dolphins, once hostile to me, were now ignoring me. They were whistling and clicking in frantic sorrow as they swam up towards the surface, towards the flaming waters, to suffer the same burning, agonizing death as their master. With the visions of the thing burning and screaming in unimaginable pain as it violently died, I finally drifted off to sleep. It was Game 7 of the World Series. The New York Yankees and the Philadelphia Phillies were tied at three games apiece, and tonight's game at Yankee Stadium would determine the world champions. 
except that tonight the game was called off for rain, even though it was a clear and somewhat humid night at Yankee Stadium, a perfect night for a game of baseball. To the joy of Phillies fans and the consternation of the Yankees, the venue was moved to Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia, leaving me with the Yankee Stadium all to myself and my date, a certain slender, humanoid cryptid. I had all of the lights turned off in the stadium, including all of the auxiliary lights, the lights in the parking lot, even the lights on the exit signs. I had them all turned off. Looking down from space, the entire darkened area must have appeared like a one square mile hole of complete blackness in a bright sea of city twinkling lights. In the middle of the parking lot was a stationary bank truck, the same one in which the creature had attacked a few weeks earlier. As a side note, I'd found out that the truck had been stolen the night that the creature struck near the warehouses. Petrova left that little detail out, but the firm's operatives definitely weren't the bank truck's original drivers. Oh well, maybe she didn't know. In any case, that was water under the bridge. I wasn't going to question the motivations of the folks who were paying me five million dollars to hunt a dangerous cryptid. In the clear dark night... The only illumination on my artificial black hole was provided by the pale light of the half-moon. I did some calculations based off of the creature's abilities and the location of the park bank truck in relation to the main entrance to Yankee Stadium. If I was wrong, the thing would certainly take me like it took all the others. I set up at the edge of the parking lot, crouching underneath the bushes lining the lot, my motorcycle next to me, and pointed in the direction I'd need it to go once the time came. The bank trunk was about 200 metres to my left front, the main entrance to the stadium about 150 metres to my right. This would be close. For two hours I waited, hunched down in the darkness, cheek going numb as I pressed it against the butt stock of my rifle. Again I was dressed in completely black tactical gear, though I only had one magazine for my rifle and one magazine for the one pistol I brought. Except for my night vision goggles, I'd left everything else behind. The thermal sights, the extra pistol, extra magazines, repelling lines, even the modular vest. I doffed that stuff to stay as light as possible. Once again, a feeling of doubt began to creep over me. A million things had to go right for this to work, and one miscalculation could ruin the entire hunt really beginning to get nervous, when, at around midnight, a skinny, humanoid form suddenly appeared a few meters from the truck, slinking cautiously and stealthily forwards on hands and feet, near the ground like a lizard as it approached the vehicle. Shit, it appeared in completely the opposite direction than I'd hoped for. Instead of coming in from the wide open street side, which would give me a few seconds to track it, the thing came in from the direction of the stadium. Was it inside the stadium the whole time? And if it was, did it jump the 300 meter distance from the stadium to the truck, or did it somehow fly? This was bad, this was bad, this was bad. In a few seconds, the thing was going to see that the truck was completely empty and realize this was a trap. Worse, the thing was effectively between me and the entrance to the stadium, and far closer to me than I would have liked. I needed to change my plan. I needed to do it quickly. Though it was a couple of hundred meters from me, it was still too close. With its speed and reaction time, it would be on me in seconds. I had to force the thing back and give myself some space to move. With a grunt, I jumped up and gunned the engine of my Indian motorcycle. Its loud roar tearing through the night air like an angry dragon in a china shop. A sudden noise apparently startled the creature and it leapt backwards in what I could only take as a reaction of surprise. I took one unaimed shot from atop my bike, and the creature jumped backwards again. I unloaded two more rapid shots in succession, before quickly dropping my rifle. Once again, the thing jumped away from the stadium, giving me just enough room to gun the engine of my bike and screech towards the entrance. I kept the headlight of my bike turned off, relying on my NVGs to guide me through the dark problem with night vision goggles is that they severely limit your depth perception, screws with your peripheral vision, 
Not the greatest of scenarios when your plan was to ride your bike up the entrance ramp through to the stadium tunnel and rock it out the other side onto the playing field. I figured that the combination of speed and surprise would give me a few seconds to get a head start on the monster, but I was wrong. No sooner had I gunned the engine towards the main entrance than I heard something splat on the ground next to my bike. Not stopping to investigate what it was, I knew instinctively that it was the substance which the thing used to ensnare its prey. I gunned the engines as my bike entered the near black entrance, the deafening sound echoing like a tornado through the tunnel. In the grey-green light of my NVGs, I could only make out vague shapes of concrete walls, corridors and stairs as I rocketed ever upwards into the stadium. I took a half second to glance backwards, and my heart caught in my throat. The thing's glowing green form was less than thirty meters from me, bounding after me on all fours like a cheetah. Worse, it was actually running on the corridor wall to my left. In the split second that I caught a glimpse of it, the thing seemed to be magically disappearing only to reappear on the wall to my right, and much closer this time. Its big white bulbous eyes were pointed straight ahead, and in an instant I realized that it couldn't see me, but was instead following the sound of my motorcycle. I gunned the engine as hard as it could go, and moments later I shot out of the claustrophobic tunnel like a cannon shot, and out over the stadium rocketing over several rows of seats and the player's dugout before my bike finally slammed down hard over 50 metres away onto the Yankees' playing field. By this time, my ears were ringing and my heart was threatening to beat out of my chest. I didn't know exactly where the creature was, but I could imagine it breathing down my neck. It was far, far faster and more agile than I'd imagined, and its ability to cling to the sides of walls came as a complete surprise. Still, I hoped that by finally getting out into the open, I'd eliminated one of the monster's advantages. I landed my bike relatively close to where I wanted to be. I was in left center field about a hundred meters from the pitcher's mound. Reaching up, I tore my NVGs from my face and quickly tossed them aside as I pointed my bike directly at the pitcher's mound, the engine screaming like a banshee in the night. As my bike rocketed towards the pitcher's mound, I pulled a device out of my pocket the size of a key fob and pressed the button on the remote. Instantly, every freaking light in the stadium flashed on at their most powerful setting, causing a blinding flash of light as if a hundred lightning bolts hit the same spot at the same time. However, as my bike hit the pitcher's mound and went airborne once again, a sticky substance with the consistency of thick black tar slammed into my rear wheel and sent me flying off of my bike. It was one of those moments when time seemed to slow to a crawl, when you remember every little detail of every moment of that split second in time. Eyes squeezed shut, the sound of rushing wind replacing the roar of a motorcycle engine, the sense of vertigo as you spin in midair, the feel of a pistol in your hand as you point it blindly behind you and fire off six shots in rapid succession. The sudden battering that you'd feel when your upper back, neck and shoulders slam into home plate. The gasping of agony and surprise. The realisation that it's not you making that noise. Quicker than I really wanted to, I stood up, instantly realising that my left ankle was twisted, perhaps even broken. My left shoulder was also dislocated. Somehow I still had the presence of mind to hold my pistol in my right hand when my body slammed into the ground. I was stooped over, resting all of my weight on my right leg. I slowly opened my eyes and instantly became blinded by the thousands of lights focused down on the baseball diamond-like lasers. At that moment, I was as vulnerable as an unborn baby. The thing had me. I pointed my pistol around blindly and impotently, trying to hear for the sound of an approaching attack while blinking my eyes furiously to get them to focus. My head was killing me, and for several seconds I was seeing double. But to my surprise, in the time that it would have taken for the creature to ensnare me and drag me away, my eyes slowly focused and adjusted to the lights, which made the field seem brighter than day. A few paces ahead of me lay the thing. It was on its stomach, facing away from me and trying to crawl away. It was wheezing and coughing as if it had difficulty breathing 
took a few tentative steps towards it, ignoring the jolting pain in my left ankle as I kept my pistol trained on its head. What the hell are you? My voice was dry and rough. The thing turned around and collapsed painfully on its back. It was then that I noticed that I'd hit it three times. Once on its left thigh, once on its right hip, and once through the gut. It had left a trail eight feet long of blood and gore behind it. Its breathing was becoming shallow as it weakly raised its thin arms up at me. Please, it said. Please help me. I think I'm hurt. Who are you? I said again. Why were you attacking the law firm of J. White and Fisk? They were running fentanyl from the docks through Hell's Kitchen and into the city, the creature said, his voice fading. Please, the thing pleaded. Please don't do this, mister. I'm, I'm a hero. I'm your friendly neighborhood. The thing's head exploded as its brain splattered on the ground behind him. I don't care who you are, I grunted. Nothing personal, but all you are is a paycheck to me. I waited until the body stopped jerking and shuddering, and finally became still. Kneeling next to it, I lifted off the mask which covered the ruined head. It was the kid. The nerd with the wavy brown hair that stared at me in the hallway at the college. The one eye inside the eye socket of what was left of his ruined head stared up at me, a shocked expression still on his face as if this kind of thing should never have happened to someone like him. I kicked the body just to make sure he was dead. Well, you never know with people like this. I then reached up under the gaudy looking red and blue spandex costume he was wearing and found his cell phone. The kid's name was Parker and the only relative in his contacts list was an aunt. I took a picture of the kid's body, then sent it to her, then dropped the phone on top of the black, stylized image of a spider on the front of his costume, now stained in his blood and gore. That should bring the rest of them running. How this scrawny little runt could have been so successful in bringing so many of us down, I'll never know. But he was out of the way now. I decided against burying the body, and instead left it out for the folks just like him to find. Folks who hunted people like me with claws and wings and fancy science fiction type gadgets, running around at night with their stupid costumes and silly capes and hunting for us in the dark places. I knew that they'd be coming to find me. That's what I wanted. Made the hunt even easier when your prey comes looking for you. Epilogue She strode slowly behind me, licking her lips and running a finger across my back and shoulders. The bartender was standing at the far end of the bar, nervously watching the beautiful wavy-haired strawberry blonde out of the corner of his eye, while furiously wiping down drinking glasses and pretending not to notice her. I'm glad you decided to come, Mr. Poole, the woman said seductively sidling up next to me at the bar. She nonchalantly pushed a brown manila envelope in front of me while surreptitiously sliding a black, leather-bound briefcase at my feet. I wouldn't be here for anything less than twenty million, I answered. What do you have for me? Take a look, she said, pointing at the envelope. I unclasped the envelope and studied the 8x10 picture of my next target. He was a man in his late thirties, athletic build, aviator glasses and five o'clock shadow, wearing a tailor-made $25,000 black Brioni Vanquish suit on the red carpet of some ritzy gala. I ignored pretty boy, instead focusing my attention on the gorgeous Amazon beauty with wavy dark brunette hair wearing golden gauntlets hanging on his arm. Hmm. Why does this guy look familiar? I grunted. He's a billionaire playboy heard Petrola, sounding regretful that this guy was my next kill. I sighed, thoroughly unimpressed by the guy, but admittedly a little jealous of Petrova's fondness of him. And the woman with him? Petrova shrugged. 
I don't know. I think her name is Diana or Diana. And they've been seen together, but I don't think they're together. She's an archaeologist and historian, supposedly from Greece. Really? I said. She looks Israeli to me. Grover took my chin and turned my face to make me look at her. Well, yes, Mr. Poole. She isn't your target. Capiche? I smiled inwardly. Petrova was jealous. I played it off as I put the picture back in the envelope and stuffed it inside my jacket. I expect the rest of my payment will be deposited in my account once this job is done, I said, staring at my own tired expression in the mirror behind the bar. I don't look pretty. I don't look Hollywood. Sad, really. Careful, whispered Petrova seductively in my ear. Your next target thinks he's some kind of bat, man. Yeah? I grunted as I got up to leave the bar with no name. And the last fool that I took care of thought he was some kind of spider man. Just like the last idiot fish man that I barbecued who thought he could communicate with whales and the one before him who kept throwing a hammer at me. I picked up the briefcase containing half my payment and stuffed the envelope with my tickets to Gotham City into my jacket pocket. See you in a few weeks, Petrova. Quinn, Petrova replied. Huh? I said, turning back to her. The firm doesn't like me giving out my real name to any of those other operators who just turn out to be cannon fodder for these creeps with superpowers, she said. Especially Mr. J. But with you, I figure why not? Seems like we'll be working together a lot in the future. So what's the harm? My real last name is Quinn. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Poole. Well, if we're using our real names, I smiled as I took her hand. My last name isn't Poole. It's Wilson. Well, you weren't expecting that, were you? Ha ha. Yeah, real uh, surprise at the end there. So... We were rooting for the bad guy all the time, or were we? Yeah, I <laughs> think maybe we were. Uh, yeah, so um, really fantastic story there from Taxi ja Dancer. Uh, not something that I thought he would be coming up with, but yeah, real sort of change of speed there, change of pace from his usual work. And I'm very, very pleased to have read that one. Thoughts, feelings, anything you want to say in the comment section below. And as usual, I'll do my best to join in the conversation. Well, quite a long one for your Monday evening's entertainment. Back again very soon, my dear friends. Until the next time. Very, very sweet dreams. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.